Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll wait just another minute while folks trickle in. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks again for joining us today, everyone. This is the Introduction to Shareable Metadata Workshop presented by the Sunshine State Digital Network. I am Elliot Williams. I'm the Digital Initiatives Metadata Librarian at the University of Miami Libraries. Uh, and I'm also the co-chair of the SSDN Metadata Working Group. And presenting with me today is Kayla Zayas Ruiz, who is the Sunshine State Digital Network Coordinator who works out of Florida State University. So, Today we're going to be talking about um, how to create metadata in order to describe content you may be thinking of digitizing and putting online, things like photos, documents, letters, um, other materials from your collection. I know metadata can seem intimidating at first, but hopefully by the end of today you'll feel empowered to keep calm and create metadata. Um, a little bit of housekeeping just as we get started. The session is being recorded today and it will be available online after today's presentation. Um, closed captions are available. If you'd like to turn those off, it's the uh, live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can select hide subtitles if you don't wanna see that at the bottom. Um, go ahead and put any questions you have in the chat today. We're gonna keep everyone muted just since we are, pretty, we are a pretty big group. Um, but if you have questions as they come up, please put them in the chat and Kayla and I will be monitoring that and we'll um, pause periodically to answer questions. And I think with that, we can go ahead and get started. So this is just a little bit about what we're going to cover today, what metadata is and why it's important, some kind of basic guidelines for creating metadata, common metadata fields you might use with your materials, um, and how to provide context for digital items using metadata, some tips and tricks for what to do when you actually kind of sit down to create metadata, um, general guidelines for making metadata that can be easily shared with aggregators like DPLA, and some next steps if you want to continue learning about metadata. What we're not going to cover today, um, we're not going to be going into the details of specific schemas like Dublin Core or Mods or VRA Core, and we're also not going to be talking about specific systems like ContentDM or Islandora. Um, we're doing kind of a high-level overview today that hopefully will be applicable no matter what schema or system you're using. And also, you know, just a reminder, metadata is something that's often covered in kind of semester-long courses, so we're not going to get to everything today. Um, but we're, we're happy to, to take questions and try and make this session as useful for you as possible. So again, just kind of the agenda, we're going to spend maybe the first half of the session, which I'm going to be presenting about kind of introduction to metadata, metadata fields and examples, and creating metadata records. And then Kayla is going to take over and do the second half, thinking about shareable metadata and how to make the most useful records as possible. Um, and then we'll close with questions and discussion. All right, so what is metadata? Um, metadata, I think there's lots of def definitions out there, but in this context, it's descriptive information about something. And that something can be really anything. It can be a, a book, an image, a document, an audio file, um, a museum object, anything you can describe can have metadata. Um, there's another definition I like that comes from Stephen Miller's Metadata for Digital Collections, which is data or information that enables people to perform certain functions. So the, the metadata is, is supposed to be useful. It should let people find, use, access the item. Um, so that's, that's what we're really talking about when we talk about metadata is how can we make the item discoverable by people. Kind of a classic example of what metadata is. If you listen to music on your computer or phone, um, there's information about the audio file, right? Who this, what the song is, who recorded it, how long it is, what genre it is. Um, Kayla and I were joking that this is maybe kind of a dated, dated example now that most of us listen to music on Spotify. But um, if you think back to kind of downloading music, this is this is metadata that you would have about those audio files. 
Another example that a lot of us who work in libraries are familiar with is a catalog record. Um, a mark record is metadata, right? It's information about the book or the object being described, the title, the author, the subject headings, all of that information that helps people find and access the book. Um, there are some important differences between library cataloging and the kind of digital collections metadata we're going to be talking about today. Um, so if you're used to mark cataloging, I always caution people not to try and replicate that exactly for digital collections, but it is kind of very similar ideas in a lot of ways. So as I said, when we're thinking about metadata, it's really important to think about how the user is going to find that metadata and, and what it's going to let the user do. Um, so think about, is there a unique story you're trying to tell about the item you're describing? Um, why might someone be interested in this item? So for example, you might have a researcher who wants to know about the history of tourism in Tampa. So some metadata fields that would support that are the location would be Tampa and the subject might be tourism, right? That's kind of letting that, that user find the items they'd be interested in. Um, another example is someone might be looking for a video of a partic particular topic that they could use in their class, like for example, a, a high school teacher. Um, so in addition to having the subject, we'd also want to have what type of material it is. So they could filter to just videos and we might want to have the date so that they could limit to a particular time period that they're interested in. So here's some more kind of vocabulary terms that people use when they're talking about metadata. Um, the resource is the thing that's being described. Again, that can be anything. That could be a book, that could be a photograph, that could be an oral history, um, that could be an object. It could even be the collection, right? The collection can have metadata if you think about like an archival finding aid. Um, within, a metadata, within metadata, we talk about elements or fields, and those are kind of the particular property um, that has a particular type of information. So the title, the subject, the type, um, those are all elements within metadata. And then all of those elements together about a resource, a resource create the metadata record. Um, so that's, that's the set of metadata elements about that resource. Um, and another thing that comes up a lot when we're talking about metadata is controlled vocabularies, which I think most of us who work in libraries and archives are familiar with that, but in case you're not, a controlled vocabulary is a standardized list of terms that everyone or that, that are used in different contexts to describe the same thing. So we all use the same term to describe the same um, idea. So Library of Congress subject headings are a really common one. The Art and Architecture Thesaurus from Getty is another great example of a controlled vocabulary. So here's some kind of general high level best practices um, for when you're creating metadata. Whenever possible, you want to follow standards for creating fields and describing resources. Um, there's lots of standards that exist out there. So you want to choose the one that best fits your institution, your materials, um, and the needs that you have for describing those. So that could be RDA, it could be DAX from uh, the archival field, it could be um, CCO, which I'm blanking on, something cultural objects, which is a museum standard. Um, you could have local guidelines, a lot of places establish kind of local best practices as well. So you wanna have these standards and you wanna follow them. Um, going along with that, you wanna be really consistent. One of the most important things when we talk about metadata is consistency. Um, and to do that, one way to be consistent is to document your practices, write down what you do, write down what fields you use, what you put in them, what control vocabularies you use, what, um, you know, how you create items for particular types, create titles for particular items. The more consistent you are, the more useful your metadata will be um, in a variety of contexts. Another thing that's really important in a digital collections context when we're talking about metadata is to know what you're describing. So there's both the, if it's something that's been digitized, there's the original item, for example, like a photograph, and then there's the digitized version, which is like a TIFF image that has been created of that photograph. And you might describe both of those. Um, and sometimes it's important to have information about both resources, but you wanna kind of understand that distinction and be clear about what you're describing. It's also really important to remember that users won't know the full context of your item when they find it. Um, someone might know that this comes from a particular archival collection at your institution, but they might not. They might come to it through Google or through DPLA or through some other means. Um, so they might not know anything about your institution or your holdings. So what information will they have to make sense of this object? 
you also want to remember that metadata should be useful not just by people. Obviously, our most important users are humans. But we want to make, to the best as possible, we want to make our metadata machine operable and machine understandable. Um, so some things that make sense to a person, like putting circa in front of a date, don't mean anything to a computer. A computer can't use that. So you want to think about how your metadata can be formatted in ways that will allow computers to do things like uh, maybe create visualizations or browse interfaces or timelines, things like that. Um, and then lastly, sort of a good general best practice is you always want to be thinking about how to be respectful and inclusive in the metadata you create. Um, we want to make sure that we are creating metadata that creates an inviting and respectful atmosphere for our collections. So these are, again, kind of some high level questions that I always encourage people to think about when you go to create metadata for an object. These are some of the things you want to think about. Um, so what might someone search for that they would want to find this object? Um, think about what would be important and interesting about this object that someone might search for. You also want to think about what will help users find similar items. So if you know in your collection that you have something other really similar items, you want to use maybe the same subject headings or the same genre terms so that those are um, discoverable next to each other. You also want to think about what makes a good browsing experience, right? We think often about users searching for items, but sometimes someone will just browse through your collections and you want to think about, okay, how do the titles or the dates work in a way that will have a, that browsing experience? And then again, how can we honestly and respectfully represent the item. We want to be truthful in our metadata. We don't want to hide things about the item, um, but we also want to use terminology and language that's respectful. All right, so that's kind of the high level stuff. Um, and now we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty, some of the, the fields and elements that are used um, often to describe digital collections. So these are some of the really common ones that you can see on this slide. Um, but depending on your type of collection or your type of materials, you may want to add other uh, metadata fields and that that's totally appropriate. Um, many digital library collections use terms from Dublin Core, which is what most of these come from. Um, and that's, we're going to cover sort of a small subset of the Dublin Core terms today. But these fields are, are generally applicable no matter what metadata schema you use. And the, the concepts are the same, even if the names of the fields might be different. Um, say, for example, if you're using mods or something else. So title is probably the most basic metadata field, right? That's the thing that everything should have a title. Um, but unlike cataloging a book or a DVD, the kinds of things we find in digital collections don't necessarily have a title, right? They don't have one of their own. Um, a photograph doesn't necessarily have a title. So you have to create one for yourself. Um, and when you think about creating a title, you want to think about how to be descriptive enough that you're giving the user the essential information they need about the item, but you also don't want to make it too big, right? So just a couple of words like the this example at the top, that's not really enough. That doesn't give you any sense of what it is. Um, but the title at the bottom that's several sentences long, that's really too much information for a title. Um, it's not easy to browse. It's not easy to read at a glance. Um, so this middle example, I think, is the best, is a good example of what a title for this item could be. Um, it includes kind of a brief summary of the item, where it is, when it is, what it is, but it doesn't go into too much detail. Um, if you're thinking, if you're describing a group of items, try to be consistent with how you're formatting your title. And again, think about how it will be interpreted outside of its local context. So if someone is looking at this item in DPLA, they wouldn't know that it's in Idaho necessarily, right? So you want to make sure that you're including that information when it's useful. That other information that was in kind of that too long title example, that might be a really good example of information to include in the description field. Um, a description field is, is a really good way to kind of tell the story of your item um, in a more in-depth way. Almost every um, metadata schema has some field that's kind of description that you can just kind of provide other information and context about the item. Another thing that's really useful about the description field 
is that you can use it to put um, terms that might be searchable that, or that a user might search for. So for example, in this example, we've provided the names of all of the people because we knew them in the description field. So if someone was searching specifically for pictures of Billy Parker, they would be able to find that because it was in the description field. So again, this is an example of when it's important to think about why a person might be searching for this item and, and what terms they might use. You do, however, want to avoid making the description field kind of like a junk drawer. You don't want to just throw in too much information there. Um, but it, it is a place to put things that you don't have another, that don't have another natural home in the metadata record. Another really important use of the description field is providing context. Um, so in this case, just saying that this is a cotton field with new growth, okay, that's that's interesting and that tells us what it is, but it's also really great to inform people kind of more generally about what, why this is interesting, why this is important, why this item exists. Um, often when you're creating metadata, you do a lot of research about the items you're working with and the description field can be a great place to include some of that other information that you discover in your research. But again, be careful about including too much information. Like remember that you're writing a metadata record, not an encyclopedia entry. Um, including too much information can actually be the opposite of helpful because it can make the item show up in search results that it's not really relevant for. So again, it's striving for that balance always. Subject field is I think another really classic field that a lot of people think about. Um, and the subject describes what the resource is about. And one of the fun functions of subjects is to help group items together. So similar items should have the same subject headings. And this is again why it's really important to be consistent and use controlled vocabularies because that way you're using the same term for all of the things. So if I had a lot of pictures of Celia Cruz in my collections, I would use the same name for all of them so they would all be searchable together. So in this example, some subjects that you might include are a subject for Celia herself, a subject for the recording company because this is a promotional photo. Um, I would also use the subject singers dash dash Cuba because I know in our collection we have a lot of um, images of Cuban singers so that would help them all be discoverable, to, discoverable together and similar with a subject heading for salsa musicians. So with subjects you often want to try for a range of kind of general subjects headings, like in this case, singers, and also very specific, the person themselves who's included. Applying subject headings is, I think, really tricky sometimes and can be as much of an art as a science. Um, it's hard to know what's important enough to warrant a subject heading. You don't want to put everything that's in the photo doesn't need a subject heading, right? If you have a photo of a garden, you don't need a a subject heading for trees, a subject heading for benches, a subject heading of paths. Like you wanna think generally about what the item is. Um, so again, kind of aim for that middle ground and think about whether if a user searched for that term and they found this item, would they be happy? Like, would that be a useful result for them? That's, that's one of the ways I think about subject headings. Again, there's lots of options for controlled vocabularies for subjects. So you wanna think about what's the best fit for your institution and your collections. Maybe you wanna use the Library of Congress subject headings because it's really well known and really well used. Um, and maybe that's what's used in your library catalog. Or maybe you primarily digitize photographs. So you might wanna think about the thesaurus for graphic materials is another great resource. And it's also important to think about what's included in a controlled vocabulary and what's left out. Um, for example, the Library of Congress subject headings really don't do a good job with uh, tribal names for native communities in North America. So if you have large Native American collections, you might want to think about a specialized vocabulary that would be better for those materials. Um, and as always, it's important to document what vocabulary you use. So, so you know, and so whoever comes after you knows as well. Um, and if you can't find a term that fits or is appropriate, like for example, if you use Library of Congress subject headings and you don't like the terms that it has or you can't find the term that you want, again, that's a time to think about using the description fields to include the language that you think is the most important and the most useful. The date field is often really useful because people are, you know, obviously really interested in materials from a certain time. And and it's important to remember that the date field in a metadata record refers to the date of the resource itself, the date the resource was created. 
Um, it's not the date that it was digitized. It's not the date that it was put online. That's, that's a different piece of information. And if you want to record that, which sometimes it's useful, that should be in a different field than the date of the, the resource itself. It's also important, as I kind of mentioned before, it's important to format your date in a way that it can be read correctly by the system. So you don't want to include extra punctuation. You don't want to include brackets usually, um, no periods, no other text. Um, it's best to just have the date itself. And the most common format is the ISO 8601 standard, which is year, 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 dash, month, month, dash, day, day. That's, that's kind of the standard date format and it will be understood by most systems you'll use. But again, the most important thing is to be consistent with whatever format you use. You're probably gonna hear Kayla and I say that a million times today. So if you take nothing else away from today, remember to be consistent with your metadata. The creator field describes the person or organization that's responsible for creating the original resource. So again, it's not the library who holds the item or the library who's putting it online. It's the creator of the original re resource, the author, the photographer, the person um, giving an oral history. Those would be the types of things that show up in the creator. Again, if there, if the person shows up in a controlled vocabulary like the Library of Congress name authorities, you wanna use that format. Again, with the types of things we have in digital collections, there's often not a name authority record for the person. So you wanna format it in that same way though. So it would be, it'll be consistent. And that's typically last name, comma, first name, middle initial, if you know it, and then years of birth and death, if they're known. The location field is one that's often called different things. It may be called location, it may be called place, it may be called um, geographic subject or coverage spatial, but they all mean the same thing. It's the location, again, the location that's represented by the object, not the location where it is held today. You can use more than one term in this field and that's often um, really useful. So you may wanna think about including both the city and the county, for example, or um, the city and the country if, they're, if you have kind of international collections. Um, you want to think about, again, what's going to be the most useful to your users um, and go with that. So there's two examples here from two different control vocabularies, just so you can see kind of that there's the differences between them. Um, Library of Congress uses this convention where it puts the state abbreviation in parentheses at the end. Uh, GeoNames is a, a great resource and is really comprehensive, um, and that kind of uses a hierarchy of names. So again, you just want to choose one and be consistent and think about what's going to be the most useful for you. So this is just an example of kind of how you think about um, location. So this item is held by the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. It was published in New York, but the book is about Maryland. And so the location field would be Baltimore, Maryland. So again, just think about the location field represents what the item is about not where it was published, not where it is currently held. Rights information is really important because it lets users know what they can do with an item. Um, and so it's really a great idea and really best practice to include as much detailed rights information in your metadata as you can. Um, Again, because it lets users know what they can do, whether they can use it in a classroom, whether they can put it in a documentary or put it on their website, or whether it's under copyright and they have to be really careful about that. Whenever possible, you wanna be specific and you wanna avoid blanket statements, things like, please contact us about rights information. Um, that's really not very useful to a user. It's also really important to be accurate. You don't wanna give false information and you, don't, you especially don't wanna claim copyright for an item when your institution doesn't really own the copyright. Just digitizing something and putting it online doesn't mean that you have a copyright. Um, the copyright is still held by the creator of the original item. Ideally, um, best practice is to include a standardized right statement from rightstatements.org or to include the URI for a right statement. And that makes it easier both for people and for computers to know what the right status is. And that allows for things like doing a search in your repository for all items that don't have copyright, um, which is often important for teachers, especially that's really valuable. 
You can also consider including uh, a license, which allows people to do things with the item, such as a Creative Commons license. But remember that licenses can only be granted by the copyright holder. So if you are not the copyright holder, you can't give a, a Creative Commons license. That's just not legally binding. Um, so it's important to think about that and, and be, be wary or be aware of what those restrictions are. Um, copyright analysis can be really tricky and complicated. Um, there's a lot of factors. I think a lot of us aren't really trained in it. Um, so it, it often feels overwhelming, but there's a ton of great resources out there. Um, and there's increasingly more for learning more about copyright and how to apply it to digital collections. Um, and Kayla and I are always happy to, to take any more questions about that as well. The type field um, can mean kind of different things and, it, and it's sometimes used in different ways, but the way I'm using it here and the way that I think is the most common is it's kind of the, the broadest characterization of the object's nature. So at a really high level, what is this? Is it an image? Is it text? Is it a sound recording? Um, is it a physical object? And this is really useful for kind of grouping items together again and letting users um, limit down to what they're specifically looking for, right? Like I'm looking for an image. I only wanna see images. Um, the two most commonly used control vocabularies for type are the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative or DCMI type or the mods type of resource. And which one you use is probably going to be dictated by whether you use Dublin Core or mods. Um, they're very similar for especially the most common things. Um, they do have some differences though. So again, know which one you're using and use it consistently. Um, so for example, just this is a the example on this slide, this is a newsletter, but for the type field, we would just put text because that's kind of the high level thing. Um, this is again important where it's, where it's important to think about how your users are going to understand things. So for example, when you digitize a page of a book, technically you have an image, right? It's a, a TIFF or a JPEG image that's sitting on your computer. But in the type field, you'd probably put text because it is a book and that's what users are gonna be thinking of it. They're gonna be interacting with it as text, not as an image in most cases. So I was saying that the type is the really high level. The genre or format field is a place to get a little more specific and a little more granular. Um, people use different terms for this. Uh, genre, format, medium is another one that's used. So, um, so it's good to double check and, and understand what you're looking at. Um, the SSDN metadata participation guidelines call this format. Um, and again, these are the more kind of granular or specific types. These let you really say what this item is um, in a, a more specific way. It can be kind of the physical medium, like for example, um, with photographs, you often want to get really specific about this is an ambrotype, this is a stereograph, um, or it can be kind of the intellectual genre. This is a portrait photograph, this is a landscape photograph. Um, some of the common controlled vocabularies are the art and architecture thesaurus and the, the thesaurus for graphic materials, but there's a lot of great ones out there um, for this type of material. So again, in this case of this newsletter, the type is text and the genre is newsletters. And then the last field we're gonna talk about today is the language, which is pretty straightforward. Um, it's the language of the resource. Again, we're talking about the resource itself. This isn't a place to record the language of the metadata. Um, and you only wanna use this field for materials that have, that have text, that have linguistic material. Um, so for example, a photograph doesn't have typically a language field, but that can get a little tricky. Um, for example, a photograph that has something written on the back, does it have a language? Um, generally, my advice is to only apply the language field to a resource that has a pretty strong linguistic component. The most common uh, control vocabulary or standard for languages is ISO 639-3. Um, and it, it gives both three-letter codes and names for languages. Um, and, and you can use either the code or the language in your metadata. Um, there's arguments, I think, in favor of either one, but you, again, you wanna be consistent so it's always the same. Are there any questions at, at this point before we go any further? Feel free to type anything in the chat.
All right, I'm not seeing anything, so I'll keep going. But but as always, please feel free to put any questions as they come up. I did want to talk a little bit about um, how you find information to include in your metadata. Often um, there's there's a lot of different sources, right? Sometimes there will be information in the caption or on the back of a photograph. Um, you may be able to kind of use contextual clues to discover kind of where something is or when it was. Um, but oftentimes you have to kind of do some detective work, right? You have to um, try and, and figure out what you can what you can learn about an object. Um, so you want to use those librarian skills and use a lot of different resources, but you but be critical about what you find. Um, often, as I said, it feels a little bit like detective work. One of my favorite stories is one time I identified where a photograph was based on a picture from a TripAdvisor review, um, which I, I was very proud of. But it's not always necessary or important enough to do that much research on every item. Um, so you want to be thoughtful about how much research is really worth it. Something I remind the folks I work with is that it's not our job to do the researchers work for them. And we want to help them find the item and understand what it is, but we can't do all of the research and explanation for them. just kind of a, a tip that I think is really useful when you're working on metadata is to learn spreadsheets and get comfortable with using spreadsheets um, for metadata creation. You'll often notice when you're working on a collection that you're gonna repeat some of the same information for every element, um, such as the format or the type. Sometimes, you know, everything will be created by the same person. So instead of typing that out over and over again, you can just fill down a spreadsheet and save yourself a lot of time. Um, Spreadsheets, I think, are also really good for proofreading. So you can sort of scan down rows and identify typos. You can kind of filter and do spell check, things like that, um, that sometimes the, the digital collection systems that we use don't let you do as well. Um, so I definitely recommend um, getting comfortable with spreadsheets, uh, learning Excel, Google Sheets, OpenRefine. Um, those are, are really powerful tools for working with metadata. So again, just kind of doing a little recap of what we've talked about so far. You wanna assess your collection and learn all you can about the materials. You wanna gather information from a variety of sources. It's really important to follow standards as much as possible and always document your practice. Use control vocabularies when it's appropriate. Think about how you can create metadata in batches for items that are similar to save yourself uh, work and effort. Take advantage of spreadsheets and always be thinking about how, how to be respectful in the metadata we create. Pause here again for a second if there's any questions. Feel free to type them in the chat. Angie, are controlled vocabularies generally free to access? That's a great question. Um, thanks for asking that, Angie. I would say most controlled vocabularies are freely available online. Um, not all of them, certainly. Um, I, all of the Getty vocabularies are free on their website. Um, Library of Congress vocabularies, like the Library of Congress subject headings and name authority, um, they also manage the, the thesaurus for graphic materials. Those are available for free. There are kind of paid ways that you can access them. Um, for example, class web is something that a lot of catalogers use for accessing Library of Congress subject headings. And that you do have to pay for that, which makes it a little easier to search for them, but they are all available for free. Um, so, so for the most part, yes, although I wouldn't say necessarily always. Yeah, and I'll add that um, ISO standards, some are free and some aren't. So ISO sometimes have, has some of their standards behind paywalls, but um, the ones that we refer to today are freely available. Yes, thanks, Kayla. All right, so for the kind of last part of my section, the first half of the workshop, um, we're going to look at an item and kind of think about how we would create metadata for this item. So here's some information about this photograph. 
Um, it's a railroad bridge in the Florida Keys. It's part of the Overseas Railroad to Key West. The photograph we know it's on the caption on the back. Um, the photo was taken by Jesse Woolley on February 24th, 1932. And there's some text written on the front. So the first thing you want to think about, of course, is the title, right? So here's how I would pick a title for this. Um, title is, there's lots of good ways to do this, um, but I would title this item Long Key Viaduct on Overseas Railroad. So that kind of briefly summarizes what the item is, where it is. Um, this lets someone who does a search kind of briefly understand what they're looking at so they can see if they want to click into it to do to find out more about it. Um, from the research I did when I was working on this item, I know that the bridge was called the Long Key Viaduct, so that's what I'm going to use in the title. Uh, just seen in the chat, would you not include Florida in the title and the date? Those are, yeah, that's a great point, um, Carol and Georgian. Yeah, thanks. Um, you absolutely could include those things in the date. I think that would be um, good and helpful. Oh, I went too far. Um, I think it's just a question of kind of local practice. Um, but yeah, I think it would absolutely be appropriate to put uh, Florida and the date in the title. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so here's a, an example of a description for this item. Again, kind of providing more context as I was talking about earlier, um, adding a bit more history about the Overseas Railroad, just kind of helping people know what they're looking at. Um, I think this is a really good description and adds a lot of value to this metadata record, but it's also a lot of work to create descriptions like this for every item. Um, so in practice, I probably don't write this much for every item I create metadata for. Um, I consider this kind of description sort of a value added element. It's great if you have time and uh, the resources to do this kind of explanatory work for every item, but it's not necessary. So the date, we know that the date is February 24th, 1932. And so we would write that in the ISO standard format as 1932-02-24. Um, Oh, and Michelle, I just saw your comment in the chat. If you know the place and the date will be in other fields, is it necessary in the title? Yeah, exactly. So I think um, you definitely want to include information like date and place in the, the appropriate fields, in the date and location fields. So I, that's why I think it's more kind of um, optional or, or a question of local practice about whether you include those things in the title. But you definitely want to include them in the dedicated fields so that way they can be searched for specifically. And um, I'll just add to that uh, sometimes it depends on on the context of how you're sharing that information. Sometimes it's easier for a user like us, like browsing a search result doesn't necessarily have the date um, visible or place visible. It's usually like a thumbnail and a title probably, maybe a creator. So sometimes it's useful in the context of how that information is being displayed in a search. Um, that you might want to make it easier for people browsing through content um, to have a quick glance um, with a little bit added information. But that's like Elliot said, it's really up to you. Yeah, that's a great point, Kayla. Thanks. Um, and I think that's also just an important example of how there's there's very rarely sort of right or wrong answers with metadata. Um, it depends on your system, your context, your collections, your um, practices at your institution. So, so it, it varies and there's, there's often multiple right ways to describe an item. So for this item, we know it was created by Jesse Woolley. Um, he does actually have a, a record in the Library of Congress. So we would use that form in the metadata record, which includes kind of his full name and uh, years of life. As we talked about, definitely want to include the location in the location field. Um, here are a couple of examples using uh, geo names in the top example, or the second example is using Library of Con Congress subject headings. Um, again, if you're if you're picking control vocabulary, you want to be consistent about which one you're using across your materials. Um, so you wouldn't want to mix up 
geonames for some items and Library of Congress for other items. Here are um, some subjects that, that you could apply to the items. Um, so including Florida Keys and Long Key, where the item is, sort of what you can see. It's you, bridges, viaducts, railroad, also including the bodies of water in the picture. Um, again, subject headings, it's, it's sort of a thing we joke about at my institution that like, you know, some of us would look at an item and apply some subject headings, someone else would look at it and pick out different things and apply different subject headings. So it's, it is subjective to some degree. Um, but you again, you want to think about what's going to be the most useful, what makes sense in the context of the collection you're describing. I have a funny story about subject headings. Ooh, please tell um, us a funny story. So I was doing an exercise with um, some of our working group members and I discovered an item with like 35 subject headings. And it was an oral history video um, about, it was like this astrophysicist or um, this, some guy that worked at NASA telling about like the, the development of um, the Cape Canaveral area as he hmm. lived there. And one of the subject headings of this 35 subject headings was soup. And I was like, why is soup a subject heading? So I watched this thing. And at one point he does talk about a restaurant and he talks about soup that he used to eat at this restaurant. And I'm like, would I want to watch this whole thing for that little bit of information that he mentions soup in here? Like probably not. So, you know, that's that's an extreme example, but uh, <laughs> You know, just be be careful about the subject headings you're picking. Yes, that is a great example of just because something is mentioned in an item, that does not necessarily mean it warrants a subject heading. And 35 is, I would argue, almost always too many subject headings. So. So here's kind of a, a completed metadata record for that item. Um, I included most of the fields we talked about here. I left the description off just for the purposes of saving space on a PowerPoint slide. Um, I also added some other fields, the genre and type and rights fields. Um, as I said, there's no one correct way to create a metadata record. So if all 50 of us who are on this call today created a metadata record, we'd probably get 50 different equally valid records. Um, but this is one example of what a complete record for this item could be like. So I hope that I hope that was helpful to kind of walk through it together and, and think about how you would create a metadata record. Are there any more questions at this point? If not, I think Kayla, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, shareable metadata um, a little bit more. So adding on to a lot of the things that Ellie just talked about in terms of best practices. Um, so this is a quote um, that I like to share about um, uh, metadata, um, and it's metadata that works well in your local digital library is great. Metadata that can be shared with other systems is even better. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about shareable metadata. So um, the reality is that we can't always rely on users finding their way to our digital libraries. Um, sometimes they don't know we have them, uh, or you know they're they're just not looking. Um, there are lots of digital libraries out there, so it can be really difficult to just find um, some of the smaller or um, like even at universities, I think a lot of people don't realize we have digital collections available. Um, so the more avenues that we can give um, our users uh, to discover our digitized materials, the better. Uh, so we wanna make sure that uh, we create metadata that can be shared to other systems. So you might wanna make your metadata available um, in your library catalog. So that's another avenue for them to discover your content. 
um, you might, might want to share your metadata with DPLA or a consortium. Um, and something that um, I like to say is that uh, migration is inevitable. So um, there, there are three things that are certain in life, if, especially if you're working with digital collections, and those are death taxes and migration. So you will always deal with a migration. Uh, if you work with digital libraries, it, that's just something that will happen. Um, so you wanna make sure that uh, you're prepared for that and uh, that your metadata is consistent um, across the board uh, so that migrations are easier. Um, and then uh, shareable, and, and then lastly, shareable metadata, shareable metadata is usually really robust metadata. So uh, it's just usually you have fuller records, um, more information, and um, the, the more robust your metadata is, the better it is for you and your users. So sharing a little bit of um, out of vocabulary that we'll be um, discussing in this section of the presentation, um, things like an aggregator, which is a system or organization that gathers digital library metadata from different institutions. An aggregator, an example of an aggregator um, is the Digital Public Library of America, but there's also some catalogs um, that could be considered aggregators as well. Uh, WorldCat is one of those. Um, things too. Um, mapping uh, is a process of translating metadata elements from one schema to another. This is really important when you're sharing um, your content to different systems because uh, your library catalog is probably using MARC metadata and your digital library um, system is probably using something like MODS or, or Dublin Core. So you want to be able to uh, map and crosswalk your elements over to different schemas. And then harvesting. Um, and harvesting is the automated collection of metadata descriptions from different sources. So that's how aggregators aggregate their metadata is they tend to harvest them um, through some method and they gather that metadata and make it available together. So DPLA um, is uh, a an aggregator of metadata. Um, they are a portal uh, that provide um, access to over 40 million digital resources from I think over 11,000 different institutions across the United States and that keeps growing uh, the longer that they're around. Um, and it's a, it's a search portal that allows users to search across all of these different collections in one place. Um, and then the Sunshine State Digital Network is the service hub for the Digital Public Library of America in, in Florida. So we help uh, Florida institutions share their metadata to DPLA. Um, we are a network of institutions. Um, uh, so SSDN isn't like a content host or anything like that. Um, we really work across institutions and we share resources and best practices. And um, we recently updated our SSDN metadata participation guidelines, which offers some guidance around best practices um, that we'll talk a little bit more about um, and creating shareable metadata um, for sharing to DPLA. So talking a little bit about mapping, uh, mapping again helps you translate from one metadata schema to another. Uh, so like for example, Dublin Core to mods or from um, your local schema to a shared schema like DPLA's um, metadata application profile. Um, so this is an example on your screen of how to um, map different uh, elements like title, creator, or description. Um, and these are requirements that we, um, uh, that DPLA has. So like a uh, creator isn't necessarily required to share this element or to share a record to DPLA, but it is highly recommended because it is better for users if there's a creator, if you know it. Um, a title is required and um, things like a description are optional. Uh, so here we have the Dublin Core uh, element code and then the mods element code um, and how DPLA maps that to their platform. So mapping is really important because um, sometimes 
we use our systems in ways that work for the materials that we have, but isn't necessarily the way that the um, metadata element was designed to be used. Um, so you can have a local label in your system if it allows you to add local labels um, that might say audio exists, right? Um, and the Dublin core element that you're using for that is the description field. Um, so you're trying to be able to sort things internally of whether they have audio or not. Um, and then you've added a value to that of yes or no, so that you can sort that better internally, right? Um, but in DPLA, that label doesn't exist because you're mapping it to a system that isn't using that local label. So you wanna make sure that when you're, when you're mapping, you're mapping only the fields um, that make sense uh, in that outside context, right? So here in this description, if we've mapped both of these description fields to the other platform, it's not gonna necessarily make the most sense outside of context. No one is gonna know what yes means um, in DPLA. So you wanna make sure that um, you exclude things you don't wanna map um, to the external system. So this is another way that um, you can address that issue of local labels or not. It's just adding a little bit more information in that, um, in that field. So instead of just having yes or no, you can have yes, audio exists. So that that then in turn makes more sense outside of your context, right? So like maybe you're not able to omit the, that specific element from your, your um, shared record, um, but you can add that additional context that will make it make more sense outside of your digital library. And then here, that's, this is the example of where you don't, you just don't map that additional description field. So now we're gonna do a little bit of practice. Some of you who have attended our uh, metadata workshops before are familiar with some of these records, um, but I want you all to tell me in the chat, looking at this record, what you think this record is describing. Okay, so we've got a lot of, we've got several answers, a lot of maps. Um, so looking at this record, um, this is a really good example of why it's important to look at a metadata record outside of its context, right? So ideally, when you look at a metadata record, it should be enough on its own to help a user understand what the record is describing. So I should be able to look at this and know what it is without seeing the object. So for those of you who guessed map, you are correct. A map is what this is describing. Um, and some of you may have known that because you're familiar with um, how um, maps are labeled. Um, so you might have picked up in the metadata record that um, there was a county number, uh, which, is a, which is standard descriptive terminology in maps. Um, but there really wasn't anything about the record itself that told you it was a map. So if you weren't familiar with maps um, and map terminology, looking at that record, you would have no idea what, what it was describing. So uh, congrats to those who knew it was a map. Uh, okay, so looking at this record, um, do we have any guesses what this is describing?
But yeah, uh, so we're getting photo slides, journals, a book about Ezra Meeker. Um, so these are all really good guesses. Uh, this is describing a photograph of three books. So it's a set of books that uh, were written by Ezra Meeker. Um, so as we saw in the record, um, the description really was focused on the man himself, the author, rather than about the objects in the photograph. Um, the title is kind of really the only indication that this is books. Um, so like having context in the description is important. We have a lot of context about the author, but we don't really know what this is describing exactly. Okay, so this is the last one we're going to do right now. Um, can anyone tell me what this record is describing? So we have a guess of videos, a biography, a letter, photo, a lecture transcription, a film, oral transcript, letters, um, an ad. Okay, so one person was pretty close. Um, this is a pamphlet. Ah, we have a correct guess. Uh, this is a pamphlet um, for a lecture that was given by Herbert Dorr. Um, so again, looking at this record, there's a lot of information missing here that would have indicated that this was a pamphlet. Um, I feel like a format would have, the, the, the format field would probably be um, a better, like instead of the uh, measurements of the item, uh, including the actual format there would have been useful the user to understand that this was a pamphlet. Um, a better place for this information would have been uh, the extent field, which we didn't talk about today, but is discussed in the metadata guidelines. Um, so, you know, I would have never guessed that's what this was. <laughs> yeah, so a quick note on these records, we have anonymized them. So uh, they look funny because we took information out uh, that might help identify where these records came from because we don't, we don't want to call anybody out um, and we're, we're, trying, we're trying to protect the innocent, right? So um, <laughs> these have been anonymized. Uh, so some stuff does look a little funny like the publisher and the identifiers, but yeah. Good catch, Jamie. <laughs> okay, so going back a little bit to talk about what shareable metadata is, um, it's good quality metadata. Uh, it allows us to get a meaningful search results um, when it's included with other metadata records and it's understandable without being reliant on a digital surrogate. So you should be able to look at a record and be able to identify what's in it uh, what it's describing without having to look at the object. Um, so just think about that when you're writing your records and you read it and you're like, can I just, can I imagine what this is without looking at it? Um, and you want to make sure that it's useful and um, that a user can make a determination about um, whether or not it will be uh, relevant to them. And then ideally it's also machine processable, machine readable. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using standards that allow humans and computers to decipher the information. So allow for, for um, filtering and um, other functions with the metadata. Um, so an example of that is someone who could do something like extract geographic information from a record. If they're trying to create a map of some kind with um, specific images and things like that. So that is something you can do with a computer um, a lot easier if the metadata is machine readable. So we're going to talk about 
these uh, four things specifically when we're talking about shareable metadata. Uh, in general, we should be thinking about the fitness of purpose. Um, that is, what is the metadata field being used for um, locally and in wider aggregations? And what does the system make of the fields beyond it being descriptive? So thinking about content, coherence and context, consistency. And like Elliot said, if you forget anything else, you forget everything else that we talk about today, consistency and documentation are like the two most important things that you want to remember. Um, and then conformance to standards. So taking a look at content a little more closely, um, by content, we mean what information actually goes into the fields. So how your fields are structured, what vocabularies you're using, the granularity of the description, so like looking back at the Ezra Meeker metadata record, um, that's a really great example where the content doesn't match what's being described um, other than maybe the title. Um, and then a lot of what's included here are the things that we talked about earlier. So following standards, using elements appropriately and using controlled vocabularies. Um, so you, when, when you're sharing records, some of the things you wanna think about is not sharing blank records, uh, or blank elements. Um, and then also trying to repeat fields when your system allows for you to repeat a field. Um, because if you're packing all of the information into one field, um, like if you have a, a right statement that's a standardized right statement, um, and then you have a local statement, you wanna make sure that those are separated so that uh, it's more easily parsable by a computer and by a person. Um, and you can make better decisions about what gets displayed and things like that. Not all systems allow for that, but that's a good best practice to think about. And it makes it easier to omit things that are not necessarily relevant outside of your system. Okay, so then thinking about context, um, it's important to think beyond your local audience when creating metadata for your items. So it might be perfectly clear to you that you mean Springfield, Florida, which is near Panama City. Uh, but since there are so many cities and towns with the name Springfield, it's best to think globally when describing your items. So would someone not familiar with the region be able to interpret the information that you're providing? Is there additional context that you could add to make things more clear? So just being really specific um, and erring on the side of, um, the, of uh, the user not having the same context that you do. Uh, coherence and context. So a metadata record should make sense and include enough information that it stands on its own. Also, as we've talked about a few times, different users may have different levels of familiarity with your collections and your context, and you wanna serve all of them. So think about what is actually useful for the users. Uh, technical or administrative metadata is important to you. So things like um, when the item was digitized and how uh, would be really important to your organization, but to other people, um, they don't necessarily need to know that information. So a tendency to want to include all of the information we have uh, is understandable, but it's not necessarily going to be relevant to your users. It's not going to be very helpful. Um, when I'm browsing through a collection, I don't care that it was digitized at 300 PPI um, on this date. I care when the when what what time period this is relevant to and what's in it. Um, so just make sure that you're um, that uh, you're you're choosing the the information that will be most relevant to your users. Like Elliot's example earlier about um, subject headings. So like if I was looking for um, Cuban singers, uh, I would want Sally Cruz to show up in the results if that's something that you had in your collection. But I wouldn't want uh, Jennifer Lopez to show up in there because Jennifer Lopez is not a Cuban singer. Um, so just making sure that you're applying things appropriately and um, consistently and that you're using the elements in the right way whenever possible. I know sometimes we have limitations in what our system 
gives us its fields and we might need to use something that it wasn't designed for. But if you're gonna be doing that, try to be consistent in that as well. Okay, so looking at this record, there are some potential issues with this um, in, in talking about some of the specific things that we just referenced. Um, so taking a look at the rights field, um, here it says permission to use must be obtained from OSU archives, right? So as Elliot mentioned earlier, that isn't um, necessarily the most straightforward copyright statement to include. We know that you must obtain permission from OSU, but uh, a user might not know uh, which OSU you're talking about. The identifier kind of gives us some information, but they might not have that available to them. Um, there, there isn't any contact information here or anything like that, and you don't know exactly what the right statement of this or what the, the copyright status of this item is. Um, also taking a look at the title. Um, this has a collection title here, um, which is probably useful information to you um, on your end, but the user probably doesn't need to know the collection's name. Um, having the uh, initial title uh, is probably enough, although I would argue that this title could probably use some work as well. Um, and then looking at the source information. So this um, source field um, might be like uh, the source that it came from in the collection, right? So like maybe this organization has a collection of silver gelatin prints and that's where this item was sourced. But um, this is more like a format than um, a source. And you wanna make sure that, that the, inner, the information here is, is more relevant. So I wouldn't necessarily have used this field this way. Um, and so you can, you can also look at this record and see some other potential issues or improvements. Um, but those are some of the things that uh, initially stood out to me. Uh, also, uh, format element here on this record, um, that includes some technical information about the digitization process, um, which again, probably doesn't go in the format field, um, is probably better in a notes field. Um, and you'll want to use something that is more relevant to the actual object that it's describing rather than the digital surrogate of the object. And it's also something that you probably don't want to display to users because they're probably not going to find this information very useful. Okay, so then thinking about consistency, again, consistency is one of the most important things. Because um, if you do something wrong a thousand times, uh, but you do it wrong the same way every time, it's going to be a lot easier to fix than if you do something wrong a thousand times and you do it a thousand different ways. Um, so that's also where spreadsheets come in. As Elliot mentioned earlier, it's a lot easier to proofread. You can identify typos a little bit easier and it can be easier to fix some inconsistencies when you see things lined up like that. So like you might be able to catch an extra space or a period somewhere because it doesn't line up with everything else in the spreadsheet. Um, so using spreadsheets really does help with um, identifying inconsistencies in your metadata and fixing things that um, like doing a control and replace um, for a typo is a lot easier in a spreadsheet than necessarily trying to do it in your uh, digital repository system. Um, so this also helps with um, ensuring that aggregators are treating the entire group of records the same way. You don't have to create multiple maps for different collections. Um, and uh, consistency also allows people behind you to understand your process a little bit better, as well as documentation, which is really important. And documentation helps you be consistent. 
Um, so you want to pay special attention to how you're using your metadata elements and um, again, which vocabularies you're using for particular elements. So like Elliot mentioned earlier, you don't want to mix up geo names and Library of Congress subject headings for places. Um, and if there isn't a Library of Congress um, name authority for a person you're describing, you want to make sure that you're being consistent in the way that you are um, formatting the names of, of people uh, so that that's uh, consistent across all of your records. So when we talk about consistency, this is an example of two different records from the same repository. Um, and we can see here that uh, on this record, um, they did last name first initial for all of the creators. And here uh, we have the same creator that we have here but they've used the last name and the full first name of the creator, uh, which is going to result in uh, people finding different results, uh, depending on what kind of search they're doing. So if I want something that was written by this person or created by this person, I want to make sure that um, they show up in all of the, the searches that I do. If I search for this person, this record is not necessarily going to show up. Another big um, field that is often used inconsistently is the date field. We talked about um, the ISO standard for dates, um, which is uh, the one that I recommend the most for people to use um, because it's very straightforward, um, year, month, day. Um, and you don't have to guess if this is January 10th, 1991, or if this is October 1st, 1991, um, if you're using um, the same format every time. Uh, this is an example of um, dates that were taken all from the same um, contributor in an aggregation. Um, so you can see here that they're using circles differently, they're adding punctuation differently, they're doing date ranges in different ways, um, they're doing approximate dates in different ways. Um, here they've added a scan and processing date um, in where you would want a creation date for the object rather than a processing date for the object. And um, this also makes it really difficult uh, for a lot of these to be used in filtering of any kind, because most of these are not machine readable. Um, so a system is not going to be able to use this information at all to help filter these results. So even though there's something in that field, the user is not going to be able to find it if they do end up filtering things. It'll just get omitted completely from their browse search um, results. Um, also, and going back to talking about best practices, um, if you don't know the date for something, which we very often don't know the date or we have an approximate date, um, if you don't know the date for sure, don't add a known or a question mark. Just leave it blank. Leaving it blank is, is a lot better than adding extra information that's going to muck up your metadata. Um, so some of these are right, some of these are wrong, um, but they're definitely not consistent. Uh, so these this is one of my big pet peeves uh, is dates. So just make sure that you're you're being consistent with dates. And I know sometimes we just know a year so that the month day year isn't necessarily relevant. Um, and sometimes systems don't give us a choice. Um, like content DM, I think, does date ranges like this. Um, but you know, just be consistent. And then the final thing we'll talk about is conformance to standards. Um, so this is something else that we've talked about um, throughout this workshop today. Um, you want to make sure that um, we keep bringing it up because it's really important. Um, standards help us be consistent. Um, so in the context of shareable metadata, we're also talking about technical standards here. So this is one place where it's really important to understand how your system works and how it follows standards and protocols. Um, so uh, 
the way that we harvest metadata is through an OEI PMH protocol, which is which stands for Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. Um, and that follows a certain standard. Um, and we need to be able to normalize the metadata that comes out of that output from your system. Um, so understanding the metadata structure, the vocabularies and encoding standards that you're using, and then um, your content standards and your technical standards. Um, so for example, in your display, you might want something to be italicized, right? Because it is a scientific name for something and that's generally displayed as in italics. You don't necessarily want that in your metadata. Um, here we have an example of um, HTML encoding in uh, an XML record. Um, this is supposed to make it italicized. It's not gonna work outside of the system. Um, so you wanna make sure, uh, and this could potentially also um, create issues in processing and normalizing of metadata um, through computerized um, processes. So ensuring that conformance to standards, is, especially technical standards is really important so that you don't have issues with your records outside of your system. And like I said, death taxes and migrations are inevitable. So when you migrate, you wanna uh, make sure that you don't have things like this um, in there. And we have a content DM tip in the chat uh, to duplicate a field and have one visible and one hidden, set one as a date properly for searching and the other text to view nicely for you, for the user. So thanks Jamie for that tip. If you use content DM, I'm a little jealous because it seems like that system is really um, user friendly on both ends. So, um, is there any questions at this point? Okay, so we'll we're almost done. So um, we're gonna go through a couple more records. It's not a ton more. Um, and we're gonna talk about how we might improve these records. So this is an actual record that's in DPLA. Um, and I'm just looking for some suggestions from you all about what are some things that we could do to make this better. Yeah. A more detailed write statement, taking out the the CA in the in the date. What do we think of this title? Yes, it needs a title. Um, if you do a search in DPLA for untitled or no title, you will come up with thousands and thousands of objects. Uh, it's not very useful. Uh, so yeah, it does need a title. Um, we could probably move um, there is a there is a creator here. So we do have a creator. Um, you probably don't need still image here. Um, in the format. Uh, and yeah, it just needs a better write statement. Like this, this write statement is concise and gives you some information, but it could give you more information and be a little bit friendlier. Like restricted in all caps isn't necessarily what you want to see uh, when you find this record. So we've uh, added a title here. Um, we've added a better more friendly write statement. Um, we've removed still image here and we've uh, standardized this um, in the way that it, it, sh it should read as circa 1965 instead of 1965 CA. Um,
how would we improve this record? Yep, people are catching that the title's not great. Um, yeah, so this title probably came from a collection title um, that someone just applied to all of the items in that collection. Um, and again, it's not very useful to someone who's um, who might be looking for something more specific. So even just simply moving the description here to be the title adds a lot of value to this record. Um, but as a lot of you said, adding a location would be really helpful, adding a better write statement. Um, if you know a creator, sometimes you don't have that information, um, but if you know the creator and you know, just even that simple, like you don't have to radically change this entire record, but even just that one simple move um, helps improve the record immensely, especially when you're looking at it um, in a search, re search results page. And I am going to take this one. So this is actually an example from the University of Miami where I work. This is one of our items. Um, and partly, you know, I wanted to include this just to kind of reiterate that no one's metadata is perfect and that's okay. You know that um, perfection's never achievable, but we wanna just think about what we can do to make our records work as well as possible in a variety of different contexts. So this item comes from one of our older digital collections that the metadata was done, um, I think at this point, probably oh, maybe a dozen years ago when we just had different practices and different ideas about what made a good metadata record. Um, and so the, the title for this item is really weird. There's this kind of format that they used to use for uh, titles, particularly for letters. Um, and so a better title might be to use the name of the person who created the item um, and kind of say who they wrote the letter to. And this is, this is an example here as well um, of our local standards that we use. We have a document we call our metadata best practices that does exactly that. It documents our metadata practices. And it comes in really handy for things like this um, because it has guidance on how we create titles for letters. Um, and I think this practice is based on DAX. And so this makes sure that, we, that we're consistent and then we provide titles in the same way for all of the letters across our digital collections. Um, we also, you know, one of the other things I would do to improve this record would be to add um, the, the format or medium field and add a location like we've talked about. So this, again, just an example of how we can always be thinking about how we can improve our metadata and what can be done to make it work better, not only in our own system, but in um, other systems as well, like DPLA. It used to be a standard to use brackets around dates supplied by the cataloger. Yes. Um, and I think it's good if you apply that consistently. Brackets do hinder machine readability, though. So that is something to think about um, when you're adding punctuation uh, to specific elements. And I think that's also a, a great example of how different types of um, or different descriptive traditions within libraries and archives are different. Um, I think it's sometimes still the practice in mark cataloging to use brackets and the systems that we use for that are designed to take that into account, but digital library systems may not be. So again, you want to make sure that you're using the, the practices and standards that make sense for the types of materials you're working with and the systems you're using. Okay, so if you want to learn more about like specific 
things that we talked about today. Um, you can dive deeper into specific metadata standards like Dublin Core, MODS, or VRA, or DAX. There's, these are very well-documented um, schemas um, that you can read about more in depth um, that offer more specific guidance around some of these fields or specific vocabularies or recommendations. Um, so we encourage you to read more about those. Um, and you want to explore other people's metadata. So see what works. Um, what would you do differently? How does the meta determ determine how you interact with the collection? So when you're interacting with other people's collections, are there things that you really like? Are there things that you wish you would have found? Um, interacting with other people's collections um, helps kind of give you like a user perspective um, a little bit more than maybe interacting with your own collections because you're more familiar with those materials. So exploring others' collections can help give you an idea of what you can improve um, or what you're doing well um, with your metadata. Um, you can learn how to use the different tools for metadata um, creation and remediation like Excel or OpenRefine. Um, you can also get involved with SSDN. We have several working groups. Uh, we have a metadata working group, an outreach working group, and a training working group. If you're interested in any of those, you can visit our website or contact me. Um, and you know, just talk to other people who are doing this kind of work. Um, we have a metadata um, Google group where you can post questions um, and have discussions with other people who are doing the same kind of work. Um, and yeah, so we also have some resource slides here for you um, that you can do some further reading about a lot of the things that we talked about today. Um, and uh, uh, these are really, really useful for doing some of those deep dives. And we will be providing a link to these slides. So you will have um, links to all of these resources um, available to you. And then we just want to give a quick acknowledgement um, for some of the slides and um, content that we used in this presentation. And then uh, our contact information if you have uh, additional questions that you'd like to send to us. Um, and just remember that metadata is a love note to the future, um, not just for your users, but for the people who are working on the material after you. Uh, so uh, we have a couple minutes left if anyone has any additional questions. Yes, uh, Carolyn, the slides will be available um, along with the recording. And I'll be sharing that out probably tomorrow once the recording is um, fully processed. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today.